Wonderful it is to me, to me. Boundless as the universe around me, reaching to the Father's soul away. Swim with love, and love and quest have found me. That is why my heart can truly sing. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Oh, wonderful. It is wonderful. Oh, isn't the love of Jesus? something wonderful wonderful it is to me to me love beyond a human comprehending love of god in christ how can it be this will be my theme and never ending great redeeming love of calvary is the love of jesus something wonderful oh, wonderful it is wonderful oh, Wonderful it is to me, to me. Oh, is the love of Jesus something wonderful? Wonderful it is to me, to me. Take your Bible this morning, if you would, please, to James chapter 3. James chapter 3, please, for our scripture reading this morning. We're going to read James 3 and verses 1 through 8. James 3 and verses 1 through 8. And we read the verses responsively, beginning together on verse number 1 and then alternate reading. I'll read verse 2 and we alternate until we end on verse number 8. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. <clears throat> All of us standing to read God's word. And let's begin on verse 1 of James chapter 3. Ready? My brethren... Be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships which though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beasts, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind. Let's finish with eight, reading it together also. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. And let's pray together. Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of this scripture here this morning. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, already for the wonderful music today, for the good fellowship here, for the good spirit that's in the room today. Lord, we believe the presence of the Lord is in this place. And so, Father, we ask you to continue to minister to hearts, Make us ready to receive your word today and the truth that's therein. Bless the special to that end. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Just suppose God searched through heaven and couldn't find one willing to be 
the supreme sacrifice that was needed that would buy eternal life for you and me oh had it not been for a place called mount calvary had it not been for the old rugged cross had it not been for a man called jesus then forever my soul would be lost but i'm so glad he was willing to drink his bitter cup although he prayed father let it pass from me and i'm so glad he didn't call heaven's angels from my hands pull these nails that torment me oh had it not been for a place called mount calvary had it not been for the old rugged cross had it not been for men called jesus then forever my soul would be lost had it not been for a man called jesus then forever my soul would be lost amen that's true that's true <clears throat> father we bow before you in prayer we thank you lord for another opportunity we have to open your word together lord we thank you for the one called jesus if it weren't for christ our soul would be eternally lost. Father, I'm praying now that you will minister to our hearts today. Help each of us as we bow before you in prayer right now to yield ourselves to you, that we will give you our undivided attention for the next several minutes and the truth you have for us from your word this morning. I pray, Lord, that each of us will receive what we hear today and mix it with faith that will profit each of us in our Christian walk with Thee. So, Lord, may Your hand be upon both speaker and hearer this morning, that Your will might be accomplished in each one of our lives. And I pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Keep your Bible open to James chapter 3. Someone said, The most ferocious monster in the world has its den just behind your teeth. Someone else said, Give not thy tongue too great liberty, lest it take thee prisoner. It's also been said, the best way to save face is to keep the lower part of it shut. It's pretty difficult to put your foot in your mouth if your mouth is closed. I remember... As a boy, when you still had a family doctor, in fact, he even made house calls. And I remember when we would go to his office in Hartville, Ohio, Dr. Ziegler, he would, at his outer office where his desk would, would be, he didn't have anything on his desk except that I, that I remember, except a big jar, and in it were these long pieces of wood. And any time you walked in there and sat down, first thing you did was take the lid off that and pull one of those long sticks out and put it on. And he'd say, okay, open your mouth and say, ah. And he'd stick that tongue depressor down there and he'd look at your tongue and your throat. He'd check you out. They could tell a lot by looking at your tongue. I read this quote, by examining the tongue of a patient, physicians find out the diseases of the body and philosophers the diseases of the mind. You know, the most common bone of contention is usually the jawbone. The Bible has a lot to say about how we use our tongue, how we use our words. Proverbs 18.21 says, 
Life and death are in the power of the tongue. Jesus said, it's out of the abundance of the heart our mouth speaks. Our words are the ambassadors of our heart. No wonder David said in Psalm 141, Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. Now I ask you a question this morning. When you think of a mature Christian, what do you think of? If somebody came to you with the question, describe for me a mature Christian, where would you begin? You say, well, I think I'd talk about someone who read his Bible every day. Or someone who prays faithfully every day. Maybe someone who uh, is, is always witnessing and being aware of people around him who are lost and opportunities to give the gospel to others and win others to Christ. Certainly it would be somebody who we know is faithful to church. Because the Bible says we shouldn't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And so certainly be someone who's faithful to church. And by the way, none of these things are... are are, are bad things or wrong things. They're very good things. But it's interesting when the Bible talks about how we would know whether someone is a mature Christian or not, it doesn't deal with any of those things. What he deals with is the ability to control our tongue. That is the mark of a mature believer. Notice, Verse 2, in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man. That word perfect is mature or well-rounded. He's able also to bridle the whole body. That's the mature Christian, according to the Bible. But we also find out that we can't tame this thing called our tongue. The Bible says later on, that the tongue, verse 8, can no man tame. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. That tells me that every one of us in this room have the same struggle. You know what it is? Taming the tongue. Taming the tongue. That's everybody's problem. It's everybody's struggle. It's, it's the thing we, we have to get help on to tame. The tongue can no man tame. You've got to have help. You've got to have divine help. You understand, as we said earlier, Jesus said it's out of the abundance of our heart that the mouth speaks. And so I understand that somehow... My, my, my words and my heart are connected. What comes out of here comes from here. The old, the old country preacher said, what's down in the well comes up in the bucket. Sometimes people, when they're, when they're under pressure or something happens and, and, and uh, things, things get tight, you know what? Words come out of their mouth. And sometimes they'll say, they'll say Oh, I don't know where that came from. Yeah, you do. It came from your heart. You see, if it's in there and the pressure comes and you get squeezed, if I got a sponge and I and I and I squeeze it, what's going to come out of that sponge? Whatever is in that sponge. If it's water, water's coming out. If you clean up some other liquid and it's full in that sponge, when I squeeze it, that's what's coming out. That comes from our heart. And so it's important to guard our heart with all diligence. So when somebody has a foul mouth, it's not a foul mouth, it's a foul heart. You got to clean that heart up. And only God can clean your heart. Only God can make that clean which will change the way you talk. You must submit your heart to God. But I want to give you a very practical tool this morning to help us, to aid us in controlling the tongue and, and help us to uh, keep ourselves from many troubles by our mouth getting us into trouble. And I'm going to use an acronym this morning of the word THINK. You know, years ago I remember seeing a sign 
make sure that your brain is fully engaged before putting your mouth in gear. Okay? Uh, so often we can just let something fly and we don't think before we say it. And then we wish we hadn't said it. And you know, you ever have words come out of your mouth and you wish you could just kind of come back here? <laughs> I shouldn't have let that out. But you find out you can't, you can't get them back. Once it's out, it's out. And so we have to be careful that we guard what we say. So there's, there's the acronym THINK, okay? Let's take the letter T. Here's what you do. Put the letter T down and you ask yourself, is this true? Is this true what I'm about to say? Remember, remember this rule about gossip. The more interesting it is, the more likely it is that it's false. Most of us are pretty D and B. You know what D and B means? Dull and boring. All right? That, that pretty much sums us up, okay? Mesh, if, if I'm doing marriage counseling and I only listen to one side, the husband or the wife, and then I make my judgment, that's not very wise. In fact, it would show very poor judgment. But why is it sometimes we only hear half the story from someone and we're eager to begin to repeat it to somebody else when it's only half the story? We haven't heard the other side of the story. As Paul Harvey used to say, the rest of the story. There's always two sides. In fact, I think in, in experience, we'd probably say there's probably three sides. There's, there's his side, her side, and somewhere in the middle is the truth. And that's almost in any disagreement or any situation. If it's uh, uh, he said, he said, he said, she said, she said, she said, uh, somewhere we all see it and perceive it in a way that'll make us look okay. When there's a traffic accident, the police can talk to three or four different people. And they get a different description of the same accident. How can that happen? Because of the way we perceive things. And so we understand they take all of the... They don't, they don't just talk to one witness and say, okay, we know what happened here. They talk to all of them and then put it together. When you read the Gospels and you get the account of the crucifixion of Christ... You have, you have some details in, in each of the Gospels that the other Gospels don't have. Why did God put all four of those accounts in there? So we can put them all together and get the whole picture. They all had a different perspective on the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we want to make sure that we get the whole story. Look at a couple of scriptures with me, will you? Uh, go to Psalm 15. Would you go there, please? Psalm 15, and then we'll go right after Psalms to the book of Proverbs. You got your Bible with you today? I, I did look at the sign when I drove in this morning. It says Bible Baptist Church. And so we have the Bible. Psalm 15. Here the Bible says, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle, and who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changes not. He speaks truth in his heart. And when he does that, he won't backbite with his tongue. He won't do evil to his neighbor. He won't take up a reproach against his neighbor. Now I want you to look with me at Proverbs chapter 12, would you please? Proverbs chapter 12. We'll look at quite a few verses in Proverbs throughout the message this morning. Proverbs 12, and if you will, 
We'll look at verse number 22. The Bible says, Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are His delight. It says, uh, let's make sure we're dealing truthfully with people. How do you do that? You, You don't just take one person's word for it. You know, the Bible speaks of, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Okay? And so, God is saying, let's make sure whatsoever things are true. And so we have to establish truth. We have to make sure we're judging righteous judgment. John 7, 24. Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Now let's look at the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Would you look there with me please? Ephesians chapter 4. This is a kind of message that our flesh won't like too well. Okay? And so be careful. The Bible says here, when it talks about He gives in verse 11, uh, that the Lord gives some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting, there's that word perfecting again, or the maturing of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Edifying is building up one another. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into Him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. It says when you speak the truth in love, when you're making sure that what you're saying is true, then you are, you are growing up. Okay? You're not just repeating something because you hear it. Don't, don't listen to talebearers. You understand, when I pass something along that I'm not sure is true, but I just heard it and I like it, so I'm going to tell someone else about it, I'm just as guilty as the one who originated it. Because a gossip doesn't just have a gossiping tongue, it's got to have a listening ear. That's why the Bible says in Proverbs 25, verse 23, Just as the north wind driveth away rain, so doth an angry countenance a backbiting tongue. So how do I get people not to talk to me and tell me gossip? Get an angry countenance about it. Don't, don't receive it. One person said, they, they usually, when someone wants to say something about someone else, and, and they don't know if it's true or not, they're just repeating it, or they have an axe to grind with somebody, they ask, can I quote you on that? Because most of the time, gossip is preceded with these words, now this is just between you and me. Huh? You know what you call those words? A waste of breath. Okay? Because they're going to tell someone else and say, this is just between you and me. And they're going to tell somebody else, this is just between you and me. And pretty soon it's just between you and 25 others. Or when somebody says, well, you know about Brother Wallace. Then you ought to say, hey, here's what I like about Brother Wallace. What do you like about him? See, turn that around. Uh, You say, then I won't hear anything. Isn't that too bad? Huh? See, is it true? So always ask yourself, is it true? But the second thing is not just is it true, but H, is it helpful? Is it helpful? Now I want you to go back to the book of Proverbs with me, to Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. Here's some very interesting verses. Proverbs chapter 6. Notice with me verse 16. Proverbs 6 and verse 16. These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto Him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, 
a heart that deceiveth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false weakness, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. So here's six things the Lord what? Hates. But seven are an abomination to him. He's saying, the Lord, Lord saying, I hate I hate six of these things, but the seventh I really utterly detest. An abomination goes beyond hatred. It, it's an utterly detestable thing in the sight of God. And the seventh thing is he that sows discord among the brethren. Now, the first six are some pretty bad things. Would you agree? Pretty horrible list of things to, to be guilty of. But the Bible says the one thing that God hates even more is, is a person who will use their words to stir up trouble among the brethren, among other believers. And so you ask yourself, will, will what I'm about to say, will this be helpful or will it be hurtful? This help the situation or will it hurt the situation? There was a mother who always asked her children on a regular basis, are your words flames or are they flowers? In other words, she was trying to let her children know you have a choice to make. You can plant some beautiful flowers with their words, or you can unleash a raging fire. That's what the Bible referred to the tongue as. It's a, it's a, it's, it, it, it sets, it's just a small matter, but it can kindle a great fire. We've learned that from California, have we not? Just a small fire, and it, it ends up a raging inferno that takes thousands of lives. You remember growing up, that little saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but what? Words, Words can never harm me or hurt me. How many understand that's not true? Hmm? Now that you've grown older, I, listen, there are times many of you would, would probably say, I'd rather them break a bone. Because the, the, words, the words go deep. Those, those wounds go, of words go down, as the Bible says, in the innermost part of the belly. They go deep, and that takes a long time to heal. A broken bone may take you six or eight weeks, but uh, you can come back as good as new. But it's not so with words. So you have to understand, is it helpful? Ephesians 4 and verse 29 says that we're to let no corrupt communication proceed out of our mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. Edifying is building up. And in other words, if I'm not giving out something that's helpful, that's going to build somebody up, then it is corrupt communication. And it doesn't need to be said. So it, something could be true, but if it's not helpful, I don't need to say it. I could, know, I could know bad truth about you, but if it's not going to help you or help another person to know that, why would I want them to know? Because it's not helpful. It's only hurtful. Truth. Is it true? H, is it helpful? I, is it inspiring? Inspiring. Again, it goes along with our words building up someone else. Proverbs 12, 18 says, There is that speaketh like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. The tongue of the wise makes somebody healthy, not sick. We've all had the experience where we say, Boy, when I heard the news, it just made me sick. We got the word, and we got the words, and it just grieved our heart the other whether the flip side of that is god says our words ought to be healthy to hear heaviness in the heart of man makes it stoop but a good word makes it glad uh, encouraging words <clears throat> the bible says we're supposed to walk in wisdom toward those who are without redeeming the time that our speech ought to always be with grace 
that it may season with salt that it may that we may know how we ought to answer every man. See, grace, what's grace? Okay, undeserved favor. God gives us His grace. He favors us and blesses us when we don't deserve it. So, could we say helpful things and inspiring things to someone and encouraging things to somebody even though they don't deserve it? Yeah, that's what we're supposed to. Now, that goes against the old nature, doesn't it? It's, it's our nature to say, hey, they made their bed, they lie in it. They, they made their choice, that's what they get. That's, that's how our old nature wants to be. But God says we're supposed to be gracious. But no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearer. Boy, we fall so short, don't we, in being gracious with our words. I was I told somebody this morning, talking about the, the game yesterday, that that I was impressed with the graciousness of the Michigan players in the comments I read after the game. They had the number one defense in the country and we rung them up for 62 points and 600 yards offense or something like that. You know what the, the players said? They said they beat us every way they could. Every aspect. We couldn't get pressure on the passer. We couldn't cover the receivers. We couldn't stop their run. They just beat us in every phase of the game. They didn't make excuses. They didn't say we had this or we did this. They just said they were better than we were today. You see, that's grace. That's grace. That's rare in athletes. <laughs> Usually they, they want to, they're the greatest and they make some excuse for why they got beat. <clears throat> but you understand. Uh, look, look with me at Luke 4. I want you to see this verse. Luke 4. We're talking about things that are true. Things that are helpful, things that are inspiring. <clears throat> Luke 4. <coughs> Excuse me. Luke 4, what you have here is Jesus beginning his earthly ministry. And he goes to the synagogue and he stands up to read. And he's, he reads from the book of Isaiah, chapter 61. And when he got done, verse 20 says, he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down. And, all the, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is the scripture, this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bear him witness and wondered at the, what? Gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? Isn't it? And as the carpenter's kid, where does he get these gracious words? We learn to, to speak like that. They were, they were wondering. We ought to so speak that the world would wonder, where do they get the gracious words? They're gracious in their speech. A little boy had a birthmark and his dad told him, I'm glad you have that birthmark. It's how I find you in a crowd. And the little boy told one man, I feel sorry for people without a birth like, my, like mine. See, his father's comment to him made all the difference in the world. And that's a good reminder for parents, for grandparents. Be careful of your words. They... They mean something. More about that in a minute. So we find out, is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? And is it necessary? Do we have to say anything at all? Earlier I said, Psalm 141, David said, Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. Saying, I, put, a guard, put a guard there, God. <laughs> Don't let... Don't let anything come out that shouldn't come out. 
Proverbs 10.19, In the multitude of words there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. You're, again, the maturity is the ability to keep your mouth closed and not say something you shouldn't want. In the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin. The more you say, the more opportunity there is to sin. Go to your New Testament and look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5, he's talking here about widows in the church. Who qualifies to be a widow? Who doesn't? Who should the church take care of? Who should just uh, take care of themselves and not the responsibility of the church? And so he's telling them to honor widows that are widows indeed. And... He talks about the younger widows. Verse 11. 1 Timothy 5, verse 11. But younger widows refuse. For when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. And withal they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idols, but tattlers also, and busybodies. Well, what does that mean? Speaking things which they ought not. They they don't control their tongue. That's why he says in the book of James that every one of us ought to be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Calvin Coolidge said, I've never been hurt by anything I did not say. I think we have a good example. When some people say, well, I just speak my mind. I just say whatever I, whatever comes into my mind, I say. It so easily can degenerate into brutality and crassness. And, and frankly, we have an example of that with the man who is the President of the United States. <laughs> I appreciate the work that he's done and the things that have been accomplished. But he's a great example of one who, when he doesn't control his tongue, it gets himself in trouble. One man said to John Wesley, I pride myself in speaking my mind. That's my talent. And Wesley said, I don't think the Lord would mind if you buried that talent. I was reading about a woman who had a very serious throat condition. And the doctor told her that her vocal cords needed a total rest and that she was forbidden to talk for six months. Now with a husband and six children, that seemed impossible. But she did what she was told. When she needed the kids, she blew a whistle. When she needed to communicate, she wrote things on a pad of paper. After six months, she was able to use her voice again. And when asked what it was like to only communicate in writing, she said this, you'd be surprised how many notes I crumpled up and threw into the trash before I gave them to anyone. Seeing my words before anyone heard them had an effect on me that I'll never forget. Are they necessary? Is it necessary to say this? Think. Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? K is, is it kind? Is it kind? Are your words based on a desire to help somebody? The Bible says a soft answer turns away. Wrath, but grievous words will stir up anger. In Romans 3, when it talks about the, the lost man, it says their throat is an open sepulcher, and with their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Same description that James gives, that it, it's, it's, a, it's a serpent. It, it can bite you. The tongue. 
a certain unbeliever was a blacksmith, was in the habit when anyone came into his shop of telling some wrong about a Christian brother or minister had done to him. And he would always say, that's one of those fine Christians we hear so much about. An old gentleman, a Christian, entered his shop one day. The unbelievers soon began talking about what some Christians had done to him. The old man stood for a few minutes and listened and then quietly asked the unbeliever if he'd read the story in the Bible about Lazarus, the rich man and Lazarus. And the man said, yes, I've read that many a time. What of it? And he said, well, you remember about the dogs? How they came and licked the sores of Lazarus? The guy said, sure. And the old Christian said, you remind me of those dogs content to merely lick the Christian sores that they've inflicted upon you. Good point. Is it kind what you're about to say? Again, is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? And is it kind? Most of the time, when we say things to others that can be hurtful, is because we've been hurt. And we pass the hurt on to somebody else. You've often heard that, that hurting people hurt people. And so sometimes when someone is talking very hurtful, you have to look past that and say, they're hurting. That's why they're talking this way. And you need to say, listen, who hurt you? Get, get to the root of the matter. And don't pass that hurt on to someone else. You say, what am I supposed to do when people say things and hurt me? You take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. When Jesus was mocked and, and, and spit upon by the soldiers and, and the false witnesses came in the, in the trial and said and lied about Him, what did Jesus say? Nothing. Pilate marveled that he didn't say anything. But you go to 1 Peter and it says he didn't say anything because he committed himself to the one who judges righteously. He just committed himself to God. He said, God will take care of this. I don't have to defend myself. I don't have to, to, to get upset. And I'm not going to, hey, you know, has, has been said, you hit me, I'm going to hit you back twice as hard. No, no, no. You hit me, I'll take it, and I'll give it to God. I'm not going to pass it on and keep hurting other people. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to think before I speak. I'm going to ask God to help me to control my tongue. Now, I'm going to give you just several practical things right now, just, just statements. I'm not going to tarry on them, and we'll be done. Number one, God never looks favorably upon gossip. He said in Leviticus, Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among my people. If someone is not part of the problem or part of the solution, they don't need to know about it. If they're not part of the problem or part of the solution, they don't need to know about it. They're not going to help solve the problem. That's gossip. Amen, Pastor. Thank you. If I have to do the preaching and the amen, then we'll be here even longer, okay? So I'll do my part. Let's do your part, all right? Number two, you have to understand this. An unchecked tongue may reveal an unconverted heart. James 1.26 if any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Vain is empty. Maybe that you struggle with your speech because you still have an unconverted heart. Number three, a look into the mouth may reveal heart disease because it's out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. Number four, God's recorder is running. This is, 
This, frankly, is a very frightening one. Jesus said, Every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Every idle word. Where did I read that somewhere that the average man speaks like 20,000 words a day and the average woman will speak 30,000 words a day. You say, why is that? Because they have to, most of the time they have to say, they have to say 10,000 more words because the husband says, what? <laughs> huh? And they have to repeat what they said. And all the ladies said, amen. Number five, I can save myself a lot of grief. Proverbs 21, 23, Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keeps his soul from troubles. Number six, I want to please the Lord in everything. David said in Psalm 19, 14, Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. John Wesley was preaching and he had a bow tie and, and the bow tie with the streamers, the old-fashioned kind of streamers hanging down from it like we have on old-fashioned Sunday sometimes. And there was a sister in the meeting who didn't hear a word he said in the sermon. Sat there with a long face. She could see nothing but those two long streamers on his bow tie. When the service was over, she went up to Mr. Wesley and said, Mr. Wesley, your bow tie is too long and it's a great offense to me. Well, he said, have you a pair of shears? And they got a pair of shears and he handed them to the lady and said, you cut them where you think they look best. And she proceeded to snip off the streamers to the size she felt they should be. And he said, is that good now? And she goes, yes, that's much better. <clears throat> then he said, do you mind allowing me to have those shears? And she handed them to him and he asked her, would you mind a little criticism? He said, your tongue is a great offense to me. And I think it's a little too long. Please stick it out while I take some off. Now, that's humorous. But the truth is, we can't cut it out. But we sure can't allow God to tame it. The tongue can no man tame. We have to submit it to God. By thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. And maybe today we need to just ask God to, if necessary, take his shears out and do some trimming on our tongue. At least ask God, say, God, help me before I open my mouth to think. Is this true? Is this helpful? Is this inspiring? Is this necessary? Is it kind? And if it isn't, just help me to help that guard on my mouth to keep my mouth shut. And I'll save my soul from a lot of troubles. Let's pray. Father, take the truth this morning. Lord, this is something for all of us. And yet, Lord, we realize you said that if any is able to control that tongue, he's a mature, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. And Lord, we need your help. We live in a time and we live in a country where everybody has an opinion about everything and they want to tell it. Help us not to conform to the world in this area of just letting words fly out of our mouth without ever thinking of the consequences of those words. Help us to control our tongue. 
that that, the, that which comes out of our mouth will be good to the use of edifying, of building others up, not tearing somebody down. And may others see it and wonder at the gracious words that proceed out of our mouth as they did the Lord Jesus when He ministered here on this earth.